Hello, 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 everyone. Today is Friday, March 10th, 2023. And thank you for joining me on another episode of Real Estate, Real Life, Real Talk, and Real Live with Damon the Agent. Um, I was gone last week because last week was my birthday. So I want to thank everyone who actually wished me a happy birthday last week. I really appreciate you all. Um, I put on one of my posts, excuse me, um, a cash app saying that you all can um, cash at me 51 cent. And I appreciate to all those who did cash at me 51 cent. I thank you very, very much. So without much further ado, let me begin like I always begin with the subject of real estate. Now, today's topic is going to be about stale listings. Some people may say, well, what's a stale listing? A stale listing is actually a listing that a seller has that actually goes stale. And there's many reasons why the listing actually goes stale. And I'm going to um, elaborate on those reasoning why the listing actually goes stale. And just to let you all know some insights on that. So for those of you who are considering listing your house soon, that you'll have a a clear understanding what a stale listing is so that way your house sells and that it does not just stay on the market and the listing just remains stale so let me begin what is a stale listing a stale listing is when a house has been on the market and it has been on the market for a long time and because and it has not sold at all so normally when a house is sat on the market for a while what tends to end up happening is it becomes stale just like with bread you know bread you know if you don't use it after a certain time it becomes stale the same thing with a house when a house has been on the market for a while and, the, and it's just on there for weeks and weeks turns into months that becomes a stale listing because then the, the house becomes stigmatized like something's wrong with the house and why has it sold so let me elaborate on the five basic reasons why a house does not sell when it's just sitting on the market for a while. The number one reason is it is overpriced. Most of the times when houses are overpriced, um, especially when they're substantially overpriced, they buyers tend to think one or two things. Now, I wrote some notes down and I just want to read from my notes. Number one, when the house is being overpriced, many buyers who view a house substantially overpriced tend to think one of two things. Either the owner is unreasonable or the agent didn't properly advise the owner and just took the look, just took the listing, hoping someone who doesn't know market conditions will buy it because the owner wants a certain price. The market always dictates what the house will sell for, not the owner nor the realtor and any agent that doesn't properly advise a homeowner is setting them up for lowball offers or no offers at all that's the number one reasons why houses become stale when listings become stale because they are substantially overpriced the number two reason is does not show well i'm pretty sure many people who've gone to see houses and houses have been priced at a certain price point then when you go to see the house People come out and say, well, they want this amount for this house. Did you see the kitchen? Did you see the bedroom? Did you see this? You know what I'm saying? The appliances were outdated. You know, it's always so much commentary that goes on after people have viewed a property. Because sometimes when a house is priced high, people will come and visit it all the time. But then there's no offer on the property. And some home, some homeowners may wonder, well, why haven't they made an offer? You know, we've gotten... 15 showings why haven't anyone made an offer well here's the thing if the house is outdated cluttered needs work to be done or just a mess you know what i'm saying those are all things that turn buyers off nowadays many buyers are spoiled i mean that's just what it is even though they may have soda money they still want champagne taste that's just the way today's market is Many buyers today do not want to put in the work to fix up a lot of properties. A lot of investors will, but a lot of people who are ready to just move into a home, they don't want to take that time, effort, or money to do the fixing up. 
So when investors are looking at property, especially those that are that are in poor condition, they're they're most likely are going to offer a lower amount on the house because of all the work that needs to actually be done. Um, the number three reason is the house wasn't marketed correctly. Now, it's either marketed not correctly or not marketed at all. Some agents will put a for sale sign in the yard and put a lockbox on the door and that's it. And they would think that the house will sell itself. Now, in a seller's market, that's true where you know the inventory is low the demand is high you put a house on the market you have buyers on the sideline waiting to actually purchase a home so in a seller's market that is perfectly fine but in a buyer's market that is not the case you have to actually be a skilled agent to know exactly what you're doing and to actually market the house correctly and marketing does not just include open houses sometimes people say oh you know they're going to do open house they're going to do open house yeah the open house may bring traffic just like the open house brings your nosy neighbors does not necessarily bring that buyer that you actually want and need so the house has to actually be marketed correctly now for me i have a saying that says everything that i touch turns to soul and i truly believe that because majority of my listings throughout my nearly 18 year career have sold i mean i've had situations where i've had contracts on property and the sellers didn't want to accept the offer you know because they felt like okay well i can get something higher and then i remember in one particular case um i withdrew the listing they went with another agent and they never got anything higher they never got anything higher because you have to be strategic when you're listing properties when it's not a seller's market so and part of that has to do with marketing um i like to say that but let me read for my notes again me like i said everything i touch turns to so i can sell water to a well i can sell bread that's stale and make sure that i never fail but some agents just put a sign in the yard and expect the house to sell itself now in the seller's market that's true so if a house comes on the market in a seller's market most agents don't have to do anything because buyers are on the side are just waiting for the opportunity to make an offer this is why it's always best having a house show well if you're trying to get the most money but in a buyer's market, there are more buyers than there are houses. Therefore, the house has to be attractive enough to lure some potential buyers. Like the people post their pictures on social media, they're posting the most attractive pictures. Some of them use filters and everything because they want a lot of likes and views. Same thing that applies to houses. Now, number four, the fourth reasoning is not having the right agent for you as a seller um all agents are not created equal everybody has different personality traits um you have to have the right one that's going to properly communicate things to you um as a seller and at the same time you know you have to want have the one that knows how to negotiate very well i heard something i was speaking with an investor um earlier this week and he told me that um he had spoke with a, this was a savvy investor. He told me he had spoke with another agent and the agent that he spoke to said that she said that she doesn't care about the market. She's going to um, list the house at whatever her seller wants. And that is doing a great injustice to the sellers. Let me explain why. For example, everybody wants what they want. Okay. I mean, people want a million dollars. But a lot of times if your house is listed let's say for a million dollars and your house is only worth like 750 or 800,000 um buyers are so savvy today that they do their research they're not going to offer you a million dollars just because you want it they're going to look at what has sold in that area that is subject to your particular property to see if that's justifiable and at the same time as i mentioned before the condition of the property plays a huge role now investors will always offer lower than what market value is because they're trying to make a profit when you're talking about a buyer who's actually going to buy the house move into the house they do their homework they're very savvy so for a seller who does not end up getting what they want they feel like the realtor has let them down especially if the realtor did not properly advise them the thing that people have to understand is that the market always dictates what a house is going to sell for it's not the agent it is not 
it is not the seller the sellers can want a million dollars all they want it is the market and the reason why i say the market is because like i said there are savvy buyers out here that do their research like for example using that example of a million dollars let's say you want a million dollars for your home and they see that everything has sold around you for seven hundred thousand you think people are just going to give you three hundred thousand because you want it doesn't work that way but here's the thing though let's say hypothetically you get an offer for a million dollars what what some sellers don't understand is that when buyers make offers they're using a loan majority of the buyers when they're using a loan whether it's fha va or conventional loan there's a thing called an appraisal that is done on the house the appraisal is requested by the lender the lender who's who's giving that loan to the buyer the the lenders want to make sure that that house is actually worth what's on the contract so let's say hypothetically your house is listed for a million dollars and somebody wrote an offer for a million dollars and the appraiser came back and said that the house was worth eight hundred thousand in most cases buyers are not going to want to pay the difference they want the appraised value well you know what dictates the appraisal on it market condition what's going on on top of the condition of the home on top of every all the upgrades or the not so upgrades to the house all of these things play a huge role as far as what comes back with the appraisal so because of that buyers who are very savvy these days they're not going to just give the owner oh two hundred thousand dollars because they want it see they're going to base it off that appraisal now once that appraisal comes back and everything if the house has been hypothetically appraised at a million dollars then they move forward but in many cases oops i'm sorry i was hitting something in many cases um in many cases what i'm saying when people overprice their home and again it depends on the market because real estate is always local and it depends on the comparable the comparable houses in the area that have sold for and also listed so you have to take a lot of things into consideration like for example i spoke to someone who said well zillow said my house is worth this amount but here's the thing with zillow and even redfin what they do is they gather all the houses that are close to you and come up with the average when they do that you have to take into consideration and i'm going to use dc for example because dc has a lot of mixed houses meaning you may have a house across the street that has been completely gutted and renovated while you might have the one on this side that needs to be completely gutted and renovated because there has been no updates in over 40 or 50 years but those the homeowner for the one that has not been renovated feel as though that their house is worth the same as the one across the street with the house that has been renovated and that's not how it works see what zillow and all them doing they're giving you the average which you have to take and keep in consideration is just like i mentioned appraisals they compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges they do not compare apples to oranges and the reason being is you can't you can't let's say a house has been completely renovated has two hundred thousand dollars worth of upgrades in it compared to a house that hasn't been renovated in 40 or 50 years that's not the same comparable so a lot of times people need to be educated on what's going on and understand that there are certain types of buyers and there are certain types of condition and there are certain types of things that are going to be looked at you can't look at it and say oh because my house my neighbor sold their house for a million dollars across the street I should be able to get a million dollar too or i should be able to get nine hundred and fifty thousand when your house completely needs over two hundred thousand dollars worth of work and people don't take that into consideration so then let's say let me go back to my previous example let's say you put your house on the market for a million dollars and it doesn't sell and you're getting all these low ball offers that's in 700 and you know maybe 750 maybe close to 800 and they're all from investors you wonder why because the investors are looking too they're looking a lot of investors are savvy. some some investors are more savvier than some agents and the reason why i say that is because some agents who get their license get their license when the market is hot so all they have to do is throw a for sale sign or go out there and write a contract but they don't fully understand that's why when the market slows down a lot of those same agents end up leaving the market and it's because they didn't fully learn 
how to sell real estate. They learn how to get their license and to tell people, yeah, I got my license. And people are going to give them a chance because friends like to support friends. And that's all fine and cool. But at the same time, when they do something, let's say put a house on the market and they don't really understand the demographics, they don't understand the condition, they don't understand pricing, they don't understand CMA, they don't understand how to communicate that to their, their seller and they just want to give the sellers what they want, then they're doing a huge disservice to the sellers and themselves. So then let's say six months later come and the house is never sold, the seller feels like the agent didn't sell their house and didn't let them down. And the agent did let them down. But at the same time, let me go to my number five. My number five is unreasonable sellers. Yes, we have some sellers who are totally unreasonable. Everyone thinks their house is better than their neighbor's house. I don't care where you go. You know, they feel like they put an extra light bulb in. They did some flooring. You know, they feel like, you know, the house can be smaller, you know, and the neighbor house could truly be bigger. But at the same time, they still feel like their house is better than the neighbor. So keeping up with the Joneses is an ongoing thing in many communication and with so much information today, such as HGTV, such as Zillow, such as Redfin. There are many people who actually think that they know more than the actual professional when reality is they don't. That's why they don't get the same results. And I've had this conversation with um, a client of mine one time before because the client had told me that his uncle used to sell real estate and his uncle said this or that. So here's the question I posed to him. I said, let me ask you a question. Why are your uncle not selling real estate right now? He said, oh, my uncle put his license on um, referral basis. I said, well, if your uncle was selling houses, he wouldn't have put it on referral basis because I don't know anybody that's just going to put putting making money on referral basis when they when they're right they have the opportunity to make money and then on top of that i explained to him that the information that your uncle provided you was outdated just like the software in your cell phone like for example if you have an iphone 14 right now and then you tell me and you show me your uncle's phone and he got an iphone 7 his phone is outdated and the same goes with the information that the uncle had provided to his nephew and I was giving him the most updated information, which was the iPhone 14 version with the latest with the latest software update. Because like I had previously mentioned, as realtors, we have to continuously take continual education classes. We have to be on top of the latest update, the latest laws to understand and let that and relate that to a lot of people so they can fully understand. But here's another thing. It's also about location, location, location. Just like I just mentioned about D.C., um, people need to take un into consideration what goes on, like what's going on right now. in, let's say Houston, Texas is not the same as what's going on in Brooklyn, New York. What's going on in Brooklyn, New York is not the same thing what's going on in Tallahassee, Florida. What's going on in Tallahassee, Florida is not the same thing that's going on in Nashville, Tennessee. What's going on in Nashville, Tennessee is not the same market. It's going on in Atlanta, Georgia. What's going on in Atlanta, Georgia is not the same as what's going on in Los Angeles, California. What's going on in Los Angeles, California is not the same market as going on in Washington, D.C. And when I say these markets, the reason why I'm saying these markets is real estate is always local, local, local. So when people tend to look at the media and they look at the news and then the media is talking about the housing market or talking about whatever it is they're talking about when it pertains to real estate, you have to understand they're talking from a national point of view. And then when it pertains to local, even local can go down because every community is different. Like in the DMV where I'm at, Springfield, Virginia is totally different from Silver Spring, Maryland. Silver Spring, Maryland is totally different from Southeast D.C. So what I'm saying is every community is different. So even though we may be local in this particular area, you got to understand what goes on in each of those neighborhoods is totally different. The value of homes is totally different. So you have to strategically and also know exactly what you're doing in order to get the most price so that you do not end up with a stale listings. I've seen quite a few stale listings and um, there are many reasons why they stale. Like I said, I went over this five. I'm going to repeat. Number one. The house being overpriced. Number two, the house doesn't show well. Number three, the house is marketed incorrectly or not at all. Number four, not having the right agent for you, the seller. 
And number five is having unreasonable sellers who just want what they want. Now, here's the thing. Everybody wants what they want. And then when they don't get what they want, they tend to want to put the blame on the realtor when sometimes it's the seller. Because even though you may want what you want, the market this dictates what you're going to get. Not that realtor, not you, the seller. You can want a million dollars. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a million dollars. And I'm going to give another example. I had a conversation with a lady this week. She called me and told me that her house was going into foreclosure. And then she said that I asked her, was there a sale date? She said, yes. She said this week, which was today, March 10th. And I said, OK, what do you want to do? I said, you know, what I'm saying so I gave her some advice what she should do. I gave her some numbers for her to call. And when I did that and everything, um, I called her up, follow up. But here's the thing before I get to tell you what, what happened. I was like, listen, we're going to have to put it on the market and we're going to have to price it a little bit lower to get a quick sale. She was like, oh, I don't want to give my house away. I said, well, you're about to give it to the bank because the bank has a sale date. So either you price it low to get a quick sale and you walk away with something or you let the bank take it and you walk away with nothing. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you don't have an option depending on the situation. Everyone's situation is different. So it depends on your situation. But here's the thing. I gave her some numbers for her to call and she was able to um, she was able to stop the foreclosure. So now what she's doing is she's doing little minor repairs and I'm going to be putting her house on the market soon, very soon. But here's the thing and getting her the maximum amount on her home based off the condition and also on the location. But here's the thing. Like I said, to prevent stale listings, please keep these five things in mind. One, don't overprice it. Two, make sure it shows well. Three, make sure it's marketed. Four, make sure you have the right agent. And that would be me if you're in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. And five, please be a reasonable seller that listens to the professional because we are professional for a reason in this occupation and field. We have to take tests. We study. It's just like you on your job is probably a professional and no one can really tell you or maybe they can tell you. I don't know, but I take pride in my job and I like doing the best. And I, as an agent, I always put myself in my client's shoes. Therefore, I'm going to represent them to the very best and make sure that they get the very most and save thousands of dollars because that's what I would do for myself. So those are the things that create a stale listing. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about um, this hair journey. OK. All right, people, people, people. Um, I'm going to talk about this hair journey because I've had people who ask me about my hair and people have said, whoa, your hair looks different. Um, I've gotten quite a bit compliments on it. And I'm going to share the reasoning behind um, my hair journey. OK, um, first of all, I'm going to show this picture of an agent who um, said, I remember when your hair was like this. And I said, yeah, that's my picture when I was at Remax. <laughs> they said, well, what made you uh, grow your hair? And I didn't even know you can grow hair. So um, I explained to them that the hair journey started back somewhat in 2020 when my daughter Zariah was born. And it came confirmation to me in 2021, like when she was about a year old. Um, like when my hair, when I was bald headed, I was going thin on top because of one of my daughters who was actually stressing me out. That's the daughter that I raised. She was stressing me out a lot. So my hair was going thin on top and being a single parent, trust and believe kids can stress you out, especially when your phone rings all the time from schools, when you're trying to put them in the right thing and do the right thing for them. And it seems like nothing is working and you're the only one. And then you got to pay all these bills and you got to take care. So I was in that position. So my hair was thinning on top. So one day I took a shower and when I took the shower, I shaved my head. This was back in 2012 or 2013. I can't remember which year. Um, so I shaved my head. And when I shaved my head, I was like, oh, well, let me just do this. So every day when I 
took a shower. I always shave my hair. So I just kept shaving my hair. So in 2020, um, many of you know my daughter Zariah was born and she had like um, congenital heart disease, which was, you know, she had two holes in her heart. So because she had two holes in her heart, um, she had to have surgery within the first six days when she was born. And then when she was five and a half months, she had to have another open heart surgery. So she had a lot of thin hair. She had a, she didn't have that much hair when she was born. Let me show that picture real quick. This is a picture of me and her. That's her when she was probably like a week old. So because she didn't have that much hair and everything, you know, I felt like, okay, we looked alike. So then as time went on and everything, um, I was like, okay, you know, we still look alike. We look, we was looking like twins and stuff. She just was the lighter version of me. But then something happened in 2021. What happened in 2021 was I caught COVID in August of 2021. And when I caught COVID in August of 2021, um, I got I was not feeling well for about three to four days. I was bedridden. Um, I didn't come out of my room except when I went to the bathroom and I barely ate. I only had like soup and orange juice, I remember. So when that happened, um, you know, I started to feel my hair growing because of the fact that um, when I was shaving every day, I was nicking myself every day. But after you do it for so much and so long, it becomes numb to you when you're nicking yourself. So, you know, me getting little scratches here and there, it was bearable. It was just the norm for me. But then I noticed when I got sick and I had COVID in 2021, I, I started to feel my nicks heal because I hadn't showered in like three days. So when I was feeling it heal, I actually looked in the mirror and I started to see fuzzes of my hair. So then I looked at a picture of my daughter and I saw that, OK, she didn't have any hair, but her hair was coming in. So I said to myself, I'm going to take a hair journey with my daughter. You know, we were bald hair. She was trying to grow her hair. I was growing my hair. So I said, okay, let's take a hair journey. So I did that. And then her hair started to grow. That's her, me and her FaceTiming. Um, I gave her an iPhone before she was one. Her mother thought I was crazy, but I was like, I need to speak to my baby. So on top of that, You see you? You see you? You see you? You see you? <laughs> <laughs> my baby. And this was me last week and everything. So this hair journey of mine has been like, um, like I said, you know, if it was not if it was not for COVID, I'd probably still be bald right now. But like I said, by me catching COVID, and like I said, I was looking at my baby, I was saying to myself, okay, well, she don't have no hair. I ain't got no hair. She growing her hair. Let me grow my hair. So I decided just to grow it back. And to my surprise, I wasn't thin on top like I was. I mean, I'm still a little thin, but I wasn't like I was previously. And I knew why, because stress kills stress kills hair cells too just like stress kills people so i had made a decision to not let anything stress me out no kids no bills no nothing because i have my buddy lee my big buddy lee he always told me that what you can't do you can't do what you can do you can do even when it pertains to bill what you can pay you can pay what you can't pay you can't pay when it pertains to kids you can only control you. You know what I'm saying? You can show your kids the way, but you can't make them do certain things. So I had started to take his advice when he used to give these things to me. And I just started to not stress myself as much. I started to not worry about the things that I used to worry because, like he said, things are out of your control. Because when you worry and then, you know, biblically, when you worry, that means you don't have faith. Because faith without work is dead. How can you have faith and worry at the same time? So I just changed my mindset. And when I changed my mindset, 
a lot of things around me change. So, you know, I just wanted to share that because again, when my colleague was like, oh, I remember you doing this and now where all the hair come from? So I just wanted to elaborate because I know some people also had that same question. So I just wanted to share that so people can fully understand. And then as I was doing, I said, okay, let me let my beard grow some more because I, I would shave my beard down and everything. I think last time I shaved it down was might have been the summertime or something. I can't remember. But either way, I just decided, you know, different looks and everything. But I'm still the same old person. I'm still the same in when it pertains to real estate. Um, so I hope that elaborated some things, even though I don't have to explain things to anyone. But I sometimes don't mind being an open book, sharing my stories, because I know at the same time by me sharing my story, it may help someone and it may give you a, a greater insight on me as a person. And I like to be like personable with people because I am a people person at time. But at the, at the same time, sometimes I can't stand people because we all at one point and another want to be to ourselves. But at the same time, we also at one point and another want to be around people and want to be loved by people. So that is me and mine. So let me come back with the recap on today's show. Well, I'm back with the recap. So I just want to real quick go over the things that I was talking about when I was saying about a stale listing. Stale listings are listings, houses that have been on the market for a while. So reason why those houses have been on the market for a while. And because they're on the market for a while, they become stale after a while. Just like bread at the grocery store that's been on the shelf for a long time. They become stale, get to the point where people don't want it. People want to know what's wrong with it. Same thing happens with houses. You know, if you do not do the things to necessarily, your house will not sell. And if you do the things correctly, the house will sell. You know, I am great. I have over a 90 something percent sell rate when it pertains to my listings because everything I touch turns to sold. Been saying that since 2005. But again, the number one reason why houses don't sell, they're overpriced. They are overpriced. If you price a house right, I don't care what it is, it will sell. Somebody will buy it. When you overprice it, people are going to want to come see why this house is costing so much. And people will look at it and say, oh, they want that for the house? That house ain't worth that. But they won't make an offer. And some sellers will say, well, why don't they just make an offer? And again, the reason they don't want to make an offer because they think you're an unreasonable seller or the agent just took the listing so number one overpriced number two the house doesn't show well please make sure your house is always showing ready because people come in there and they look at everything i've taken people to see houses i remember one time taking two ladies um when i went into the house the buyer was with me. Her girlfriend had stopped at the front door. I had to go back and get her girlfriend and said, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm looking at the pictures and everything to see who lives here. I said, but you're not even the one buying the house. Your girlfriend is. So you need to stay with us. But at the same time, though, people are nosy. People are looking at things. And people get easily distracted when they go into houses. So if you declutter, if you keep the house clean, if you make it such as showing ready, you know what I'm saying? That will help with the sale of your house. Number three, not marketing a house at all will sometimes not get the house sold. In a seller's market, yes, you don't have to do anything. Sometimes you don't even have to put a for sale sign up and it will sell itself. But in a buyer's market, you have to work. You have to know exactly what you're doing in order to sell that house. Number four, not having the right agent. Listen, I feel personally like I'm the right agent for everyone because I've had all types of clients. I've had black, white, African, Asians, Indian, um, straight, not straight. You know, I've had them all short, tall. You know, my thing is, though, personality wise, I've had them all, too. Very analytical, not not analytical at all. So it's also about just understanding the client's needs. So always want to make sure that you have the right agent for you because all agents are not created equal. You know, you can have five, 10 agents who got their license. And it doesn't mean five or 10 agents know exactly what they doing. I always like to compare real estate agents to cab drivers. There are a lot of cab drivers out there. 
Many of them, you wonder how in the world they get their license. But guess what? They have two licenses. They have a driver's license and a cab driver's license. But you wonder, how do they get their license? They don't merge. They don't put their signals on. They cut in front of you. They almost cause accidents. But guess what? They're cab drivers and they're out there driving. Same thing with real estate agents. All agents are not created equal. Always do your research. Always interview, talk, and everything so you make sure that you have the right agent for you. And then number five unreasonable sellers please be very reasonable as a seller because at the same time we want to be properly advised you know what i'm saying you have to be realistic like we all want what we want people want to be want a million dollars you know the reality is is what the reality is and remember that when it pertains to real estate real estate is always about location 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 and the condition of the home and the comparables around it so these things play a huge factor as far as the value cost of your house before an agent can even put it on the market. So here's another thing to take into consideration. Of course, the higher the house sell, the higher an agent gets paid. But if you're unrealistic, the house is not going to sell. And the thing about it is, though, is the agent nor you are going to get paid if the house doesn't sell. So please be reasonable. And then again, like I said about my hair journey, you know, I started the journey. My daughter, who was born, she actually, you know, was born, didn't have much hair. Her hair started to grow. I caught COVID in 2021. I said, hey, let me let my hair grow. So, you know, we take pictures. I'm a, I post pictures when we both were bald, when we both have hair, and we both getting a little bit more hair. So, you know, take this journey with my daughter. Let her know that daddy's always there with her, no matter what she goes through. So that's just the type of person that I am. I want to thank you all for joining me each and every Friday at 12 noon. Now, next week, I'm going to go back to having a guest spotlight speaker every week. So next week, I'm going to have a, a loan officer come on to elaborate and to talk about what's going on with the loan product. And I'm going to talk about the spring market, you know, from a buyer's and seller's perspective. So that's going to be next week's topic. I want to thank each and every one of you all for coming and joining me. I appreciate you all. Please follow me on all social media platforms. Um, if you're on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn, you'll see all of them. Please follow me on all of them, especially on TikTok, y'all, because I'm trying to go live on TikTok and I got to have at least a thousand followers before I can even go live on there. And I think I, don't, I, mean, I got 500 and something. So I'm like pretty much halfway there, but I'm not all the way there yet. But I need your support. I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. I want to thank you all for saying happy birthday to me again last week. I want you all to know I celebrate the entire month of March, all March long. So if y'all still want to cash at me 51 cents, um, guess what? Y'all can still do that. Uh, just type in my number or my email address. Um, and, you know, I'm still everywhere I go. I tell them it's my birthday. I give me a birthday cake. That's why when some of you all saw me post something recently, y'all saw me with the cakes and everything. Because I've been going out every single day. And my buddy Ricardo, we going out to the... Uh, we're going out in Virginia tonight to hang out, learn some Latin dancing. So we're going to go do that tonight. But at the same time, though, I appreciate each and every one of you all. I want to thank you all for always tuning in each and every Friday. Next week, I have a guest again. And I'm going to be doing that every week for, for going. So I want you all to enjoy your weekend. Have a great weekend. And I shall see you all soon. All right. Thank you all. Have a great one. <laughs>